So the Open Philanthropy Project's mission is to give as effectively as they can and share their findings openly so that anyone can build on their work. Through research and grant making, they hope to learn how to make philanthropy go especially far in terms of improving lives. They're passionate about maximizing the impact of their giving and they're excited to connect to other donors who share their passion. In this talk, Claire Zabel will share some of the Open Philanthropy Project's big updates from 2017 so far. In particular, she will focus on their progress in, some scientific, in the scientific research program and will discuss some of the grants they've made that she thinks exemplify their approach, approach to hits-based giving. Claire joined GiveWell in August of 2015. She currently works on a variety of projects for the Open Philanthropy Project, especially in scientific research. Claire graduated from Stanford in 2015 with a BS and MS in Earth Systems. Claire, welcome to the stage. Hi, everyone. Is it all right if I close this? Yes. I'm gonna try it. Can you hear me okay? Great. Uh, Great, so I'm a research analyst at the Open Philanthropy Project, and uh, I'll talk to you mostly about uh, what we've been doing recently, and especially, oh, that just got louder, especially what we've been doing in our scientific research program, which I think is especially appropriate for this EA Global with its focus on science. Um, and so very briefly, I'll tell you just what Open Phil is in case anyone wandered in just now and didn't hear Chelsea talk about it. Uh, so the Open Philanthropy Project is a philanthropic organization. It arose from a collaboration between GiveWell and uh, Good Ventures. Good Ventures is the foundation of Dustin Moskowitz and Carrie Tuna. They've pledged to give away the majority of their fortune, which is part of the Facebook fortune, and they're trying to do as much good as possible with their money. We're here to help them do that. Um, to, and to that end, we make grants to organizations and people that we think could plausibly do the most good. And we also do research to improve our giving process. Right now, we've chosen some focus areas where we think we should concentrate our giving uh, in order to do as much good as possible. That's mostly in US policy scientific research and global catastrophic risks. I think that US policy is self-explanatory and I'm gonna talk about science later, but for those of you that don't know, by global catastrophic risks, I mean uh, risks that could, if they occurred, potentially derail human civilization and they might have a small chance of occurring, but you can imagine that avoiding those sorts of outcomes is very important to us. And so the main areas in those kind of broader focus areas are AI, which is, our program is called uh, Risks from Advanced Artificial Intelligence. And by that we mean that we're trying to make it the case that as artificial intelligence continues to advance, it advances in a way that's safe and beneficial. Uh, and as it gains capabilities, those capabilities are used for good. Uh, BPP, Biosecurity and Pandemic Preparedness. That's uh, our program oriented around stopping risks from pathogens that might be natural or engineered to cause infectious diseases that harm the world. Criminal justice reform, where we're mostly focusing on stopping mass incarceration. Um, farm animal welfare, where we're trying to end the horrible abuses that farmed animals endure. Lewis, my colleague, is talking more about that and then scientific research, which I'm going to get into. Our general model is that we have a few people focusing on each of those areas, usually one or more domain experts, people that have been working in that field for a long time, plus generalists who, many of them come out of the EA community who have a strong sense of the goals we're trying to achieve. And um, right now there's not a lot of miscellaneous giving, there's not a lot of giving that's outside of the categories that I just mentioned. We try to take exceptional opportunities whenever we see them, um, but in practice, we think that there are large gains to be had from focusing and learning a lot about the areas that we give a lot of grants in. We have done a bunch of grants uh, to effective altruist organizations, and we've done a few to global catastrophic risk organizations other than the ones I named, um, but other than that, there's not that much. And this is part of our hits-based giving ph philosophy, that basically means that we expect that uh, in order to do the most good, it might be good to expect many of your programs to be a failure. 
that means that we make a lot of grants that we actually don't expect to do very much because they're taking big risks and they have ambitious goals. And so we expect to see a lot of failure. We're hoping for a few hits, and those could be massive wins uh, that are our goals in each of the areas that we work in. So we would love to see that, um, and we're willing to take on more risk than most philanthropic organizations tend to do because we think that, in the end, that'll have higher expected value. Some brief highlights. So last year, I'm very happy to report that we moved over $100 million to our grantees um, to exceptional projects that I think will end up doing a lot of good in the world in total. Um, we worked mostly on hiring and onboarding, so we scaled up a lot, the organization grew. Uh, we hired domain experts and we got them acquainted with open philanthropy. Um, and we realized that we can move a lot of money. That was one of our main tests for last year. We wanted to figure out can we really move all of this money and to good causes? Do we have the capacity? Do we know how? Can we choose them? Can we evaluate them? Can we communicate about them and make sure that the money gets delivered? Now we'll be focusing on uh, evaluating how those grants are going and optimizing our processes. We think that although we could move more money, we're not likely to increase our giving by that much uh, for this, uh, this year because of this focus on fine tuning. And also because we realize that we're seeding a lot of fields. We're taking a lot of really young, small fields and making them big. And that means that they will probably need more money in the future than they need now. Um, so we think that there's, although there are costs to not giving all of the money right now, some of the money is not doing as much good as it could be if it was in use. We think that overall it's worth it to wait um, before trying to give as quickly as possible. Uh, so we're working on learning about uh, how to fine tune our processes and how to communicate our findings. Um, and we're also working on learning from the history of philanthropy. So we wanna figure out what can we learn from the past? What can we learn from what other organizations have done and their successes and failures? Uh, we have a number of case studies where we're studying their approaches and trying to figure out what the lessons are and we plan to communicate those. We're both using them personally and we're hoping to communicate them to other funders and other people that are in a position to give away money so that they can also give as effectively as possible. So those were my general open fill highlights. Now I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about science. So the scientific research program is relatively recent. It really just ramped up in 2016 and we're still trying to figure out exactly how we're gonna uh, break down our different focuses. We're looking both at foundational science and applied. So by foundational science, I mean science that's aimed at learning things or developing new uh, capabilities versus applied science, which is uh, using that knowledge and those capabilities to achieve specific aims. Um, and we're trying to think about how to do science that does as much good as possible. Uh, and I think that presents some of its own challenges. The main ones that come to mind are that Foundational science often has uh, unanticipated impacts. It's hard to guess exactly where it's going. As you learn new things, you obviously don't know exactly what they're going to mean or what their implications will be, otherwise you would already know them. And so it's hard for us sometimes to know how to estimate uh, the impact of that funding. And then also the technical work in science takes a lot of effort to understand, I think, Science is just so rich and it's so complicated and detailed. It's time consuming for the generalists to come to fully understand uh, the research that different researchers are proposing. So that's, that's something we're working on. Those are challenges that we're wrestling with. Luckily, we have two amazing science advisors, Chris Somerville and Heather Youngs, who have worked in science their whole lives, basically, since they were adults, and are incredibly knowledgeable. Um, they work with me and Nick Beckstead, and they have done a number of investigations into different topics that we were interested in and been able to explain a lot of what's going on in those fields, give us the takeaways, and help us figure out where our money can make a big difference in those fields. So um, that's been one of the main ways we've learned. Another way that we've learned is that we've been doing a survey of top scientists. We've talked to about 30 of the greatest scientists and we've just asked them how do they see 
the systemic issues in their field? How do they think science could be improved through money um, if it can? How can one do that? And like, why do they think that? How did they come to those conclusions? And I think we've learned a lot from those conversations as well. I think that they've been really useful and I'm excited to later on start to report some of the things that we've learned. And then finally, we started making grants. And so I'm gonna highlight a few of the grants I think are really cool um, and that demonstrate some of what I've just talked about. We are doing grant making that's related to our other cause areas. So that, those are grants that are in service of goals that we had already identified. An example of this is um, there's a company called Impossible Foods that has created a plant-based burger that um, it was founded by this biochemist, Pat Brown, who is absolutely a stellar researcher, and he knows a lot about biochemistry, and he's been able to create a burger, a product that I think is more similar to um, actual meat products than any other previous burger that wasn't actually made from meat. And um, we're hoping that that company can branch out into other products and eventually create a number of amazing products that will make it so that people uh, can have delicious food that they want uh, without having to cause all the suffering that goes on at factory farms. So we made an investment in Impossible Foods. We're hoping that that will speed their development of these products, and um, especially in food categories that affect a lot of animals, like chicken products and fish. An example of a more foundational science grant was our grant to Ed Boyden over at MIT, which is just over in some direction from here. <laughs> Not sure which one, I believe it's close by. Um, and so a goal is to figure out how we can map the neural connections in the brain and understand how the neurons in the brain are connected to each other. That's called the brain connectome. So that's a goal. Um, this goal has been very difficult to accomplish in the past. And a reason for that is that uh, neurons are very small and it is they're small enough that it's difficult to see them with light microscopes, which means you have to use electron microscopes. But electron microscopes are very expensive and they're difficult to use and some of the process of preparing samples for use with electron microscopes actually destroys some of the structure. So that makes it um, suboptimal and it mean, means that uh, finding the full brain connectome that way could take hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars. But at Boyden, MIT had this idea that um, instead of trying to see small things better, maybe we could make the small things bigger and then we could use light microscopes. So he invented this technique called expansion microscopy that is actually seems to be able to still imperfectly expand these samples of brain tissue with actually still preserving all of the structure. And so we hope that uh, by funding his research, we can move forward towards the goal of mapping the entire brain using these light microscopes and expanded samples. And then if we're actually able to do that, it won't be as expensive. And so we won't only be able to understand the connectome of one brain, we'll be able to look at many different brains from human brains and animal brains. And we don't know what that'll lead to, but it might lead to a better understanding of mental illness or how thinking works or nothing. <laughs> We don't know, but we think it could be a big win. Um, and then finally, I want to talk to you about uh, the last program I think is really cool, which is called the Transformative R01. This is an NIH program, actually, a National Institutes of Health program. Uh, R01s are research grants, which is what they call them, and the Transformative R01 is part of their high-risk, high-reward research program. And the idea there is for NIH to support the most ambitious, innovative, and risky research. Uh, but it actually only is able to fund a few percent of the proposals that come in from scientists all around the country. And we heard them say that, unfortunately, they can't support all of the proposals, but there's a lot of amazing, innovative, high-risk proposals that are not getting funded. And so we asked them, and they actually said that we could just look at all of the proposals that they rejected and see if we wanted to give those proposals a second chance. And I think that that's cool because, first of all, we didn't demand that people do additional work. They already had these proposals written. They'd gotten rejected. Uh, for the, from their perspective, things could only look up. 
And we were able to look at all of these proposals in, from all different disciplines of science and learn what scientists thought was the most cutting edge, ambitious things that could be achieved. So it was really an amazing learning process as well as uh, actually giving us access to some, some good potential grantees. And so we've re looked at those, we've reviewed over 100 proposals at now, and we're getting very close to figuring out all of the ones we're gonna fund. And I think that there's some very special research projects that were not funded on the first round and that luckily we'll be able to step in and fund. So that's my summary of science. We're getting very close to a broad plan for science and we'll hope to publish it sometime this year and explain more about our thinking and our, what we've learned so far. But hopefully I've given you a taste for it and uh, I'll take your questions. All right, let's first thank you. Um, yeah, so we had a couple of questions that seemed to go in uh, the direction of uh, what like an individual donor should do, whether or not they should like try to mimic the behavior of the Open Philanthropy Project, you know, really try to go for this hits-based giving thing, or they should invest in the stock market, you know, just give to like give well-recommended charities that have a stronger track record. Um, should people also assume that they might be able to like beat the average in some way, perhaps just mimicking your donation behavior? Thanks, that's, can you hear me? Cool, um, that's an interesting question. I think that the answer basically is um, that you could try either, and I think that the EA community has come up with a number of different ways that can facilitate that. So, you know, if, if you're a large funder, OpenPhil would potentially be happy to talk to you about your giving. Uh, I think that moving into a new area and figuring out the best giving opportunities is a very time consuming procedure. I certainly think it's within reach of a lot of people if they're able to spend that time. So they could try to do that. Um, and they might succeed depending on how much time you have and you know how interested you are in it. I think there are some alternatives that might present a third path that could be better. For example, um, there are these kind of index funds coming out of CEA where you can contribute to high risk causes, and you can contribute to a variety of them if you wanna be sure that your, your donation or your contribution has an impact. It's more likely if you're contributing a small amount to many relatively risky projects. So you can do that and you can especially, you can tailor it to your personal cause prioritization. So I recommend looking into that if it's something you're interested in. Another method that's been discussed is a donor lottery, which is where a lot of people uh, pledge to give in money, a certain amount of money that they want to contribute, and then it's like a lottery, the winner is randomly selected, and the, the winner of the lottery just is in charge of deciding where to give all of the money that people pledged. And the idea there is that it's not necessarily worth as much time to think about your giving if you're giving a small amount, but if you're giving a larger amount, it's much more likely to be worth your time. And so many small donors can come together and say, for each of us individually, we might be tempted to give without thinking it through because it's just not worth the time for our small amounts. But if instead we can um, choose a winner to give a large amount, it will be worth it for that winner and hopefully they'll give better than we would individually. And so I think there was one last year, maybe it was a few months ago, and I think that they're planning to do another one of those lotteries. So look out for that if it's something you're interested in. seem like a couple of neat things people could do. Um, if I can get a time check, we have quite a few questions, so I wanna know how in depth we can get 12 minutes. All right. Um, yeah, so we have a few questions in the like US policy governance direction, so I'll, I'll float those by you first. Um, so one person asks if you can expand on the approach to influencing US policy and how and if that's changed after Trump's election. I can get a little political, but... Um, I, I know that Dustin and Carrie might have had some views on this in particular. Yeah, um, thanks, that's an interesting question. Uh, GiveWell and OpenPhil are separating, but as part of GiveWell, which is a 501c3 organization, we uh, are very limited in terms of the political advocacy that we can do because we can't do lobbying. So uh, OpenPhil 
uh, was n is not able to do direct lobbying. Um, and Carrie and Dustin do some personal giving that's separate from Open Philanthropy Project. So we're, you know, uh, that's not really part of Open Phil. I think that our, our strategies in US policy, like I said, it's mostly focused on farm animal welfare and criminal, criminal justice reform. And because farm animal welfare is a niche issue that's not really so partisan, and criminal justice reform is, to my knowledge, somewhat more local, the uh, election hasn't influenced it as much as it's influenced some other areas. And since we anticipate staying in those two areas for the most part, we haven't been, um, we haven't changed our strategy that much as a result of the election. All right, and on the note of uh, criminal justice reform, uh, what do you think the two or three biggest factors are getting in the way of you know, really radically improving the system? I'm gonna skip that question because I don't think I know enough about our criminal justice reform uh, program to do it justice. Sure, fair enough. Um, yeah, uh, I'm gonna move a little bit in the science direction then since we have uh, a few more questions coming in in that direction. Um, yeah, we had one, sorry, I lost that question. Um, oh yeah, you, you said that you have some programs, and you know that hits-based giving, it means either they could have no impact perhaps by default, or maybe they're exceptionally good, but you said that there might be some programs that could also have results that are drastically bad in some way, um, and it's because it's just so high variance, it's really hard to anticipate what the result's going to be. Do you have an example of a, a research program that falls along those lines? That could have negative impacts? Sure. Uh, uh, so obviously we try not to uh, fund research that we think could have a much higher chance of having a negative impact than a positive impact. Um, but I mean, it's inevitable that some of it has some risk of doing harm. An example of this is the Ed Boyden grant that I talked about. Um, so it's possible, for example, that mapping the brain connectome could lead to advances in artificial intelligence that are rapid and potentially not as well controlled and don't have as much concern for safety as we would like. So it's possible that that funding will actually have a negative impact on our goal of increasing safety and artificial intelligence. It's also possible it'll have a positive impact and overall we thought since it could go either way and it had these other benefits, it, and we didn't think the negative impacts were particularly likely, uh, we thought it was worthwhile, but it's a risk that we acknowledge and it's one that we were concerned about. So given that you're giving to things in expectation of being, uh, them being good, uh, can you elaborate on OpenPhil's plans for evaluating the grants after they've been given out? Yeah, so we don't have a full plan yet actually. We're still developing it. One, one thing that I think will be really useful for this is, um, I'm just gonna repeat this. Um, speak loudly. So one thing that we think will be really useful for this is that we've been making predictions about our grants. So for each grant that we make, we make a series of predictions about how we expect that it'll go. We'll, uh, for example, we, if it has, there's some sort of concrete goal we have, we estimate how likely we think it is that it'll achieve that goal. We time bound all of those predictions. We say what date we think it'll achieve it by or whether we'll know or not by then. Um, and I think that'll be useful for evaluating our, perf our performance. We plan to go back through all of those predictions as soon as the, the date has passed at which we thought we could learn about the prediction and see if we're well calibrated about our giving. So seeing if we're you know, overconfident or underconfident about uh, the impact of our grants and how positive it'll be. And I think that'll be really useful for learning. Um, we also have a very informal process by which grant investigators talk about their portfolio and how it's performed and ways in which that surprised them versus ways in which it was kind of expected. Um, so I think both of those are, have been useful and important. We've written up a little bit, uh, we've just started writing up some grant um, updates after grants that have ended about the impact and we've just started seeing some of the impacts of our earlier grants. I think that um, there's a lot more work to be done there though and we haven't totally figured it out. Yeah, uh, Open Phyllis said uh, both that uh, one of its goals is to help other philanthropists try to figure out how to give, you know, take, take lessons that you've learned along the road, but also that it's quite difficult to uh, make public the, the kind of nuanced things that you're learning along the way. Yeah. Um, this may also be a thing that you don't have a plan about, but might you be able to shed light on, on how you balance those uh, kind of opposing forces? Yeah, that's a good question. 
Uh, so one strategy is sometimes we talk to people privately. It's sometimes it's easier to uh, share information with one individual than share it on the internet. Uh, when you share things on the internet, you have to be really worried about anything being taken out of context, which means that uh, we try to be very thoughtful about our language. When you kind of know someone's perspective and you know what they're interested in, I don't think that you have to worry about that to the same degree. So sometimes that's a quick way of sharing things with people um, that we don't share online. Uh, there is still some, a lot of tension between those goals and we're still trying to figure out how to balance it. I think that for the most part we haven't found that publishing all of the details of everything we do is as necessary as making it really clear what our approach is, how we implemented that approach broadly, and then how that approach actually performed. And I think it's something we'll think about more as we actually can know more about our performance. We don't wanna share something that is actually not a good model uh, and we're still improving our model. Great. Um, yeah, um, one person asks what daily life would look like once all the necessary charitable projects have been completed. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, I think I can answer that question. Wonderful, but <laughs> perhaps you have something <laughs> yeah. on that note as well. Quite good, um, probably very different from how it looks today. Um, I don't think that, like, I don't think that that is anywhere close, even on like probably millennial time scales, um, because you know we think that the future will bring new challenges. Uh, if something very dramatic happens, for example, we're able to create artificial intelligence that is uh, safe and very powerful and has goals that are aligned with ours, it might be able to help guide human civilization far better than we can. Um, and so perhaps at that time, there won't be as much of a role for philanthropy, um, but that's very speculative. I think that uh, you know, our goals are extremely ambitious. We would, like to see, uh, we would like to see people and all sentient beings have happy, good experiences and not suffer from um, pain and negative experiences, and except unless they're like voluntary, uh, especially the more horrific ones, although there's not complete staff consensus on that. I think once you go out to the very edges, people start having less consensus on what a good end goal would be. But I don't think that this is anywhere close to where we are, and I'm not sure how, uh, how, how helpful it is to, for me to try to imagine what the world will look like once we have very, very different technological capabilities than what we have today. Fair enough. And um, uh, for people who aren't very uh, familiar with uh, the, you know, the specific researchers at OpenPhil and the money that's backing it, uh, the priorities that OpenPhil has decided to prioritize may look a little hodgepodge. They may be kind of curious why you're focusing on criminal justice reform and factory farming reform, but also these emerging technologies. Do you feel like there's some through line that uh, draws greater continuity in the cause areas? I think that the best way to understand that is to look at our blog post on worldview diversification. And so we think that there's a few different worldviews that seem pretty plausible and reasonable uh, once you examine them very closely. And we're lucky enough to have a number of very philosophical people on staff who are interested in doing that and helpful. And then within each of those worldviews, we try to pick the best thing that we can do. So one plausible worldview might be you should basically help humans who are alive right now. You shouldn't worry too much about non-human sentient beings or uh, the far future because that's not as important. And then we'd say, okay, that sounds like a pretty reasonable thing to think. If you thought that, what would be the best things to do? And then we think that there's actually only a few really plausible candidates for large scale philanthropy once you start thinking about that. And then another plausible worldview might have more of a future orientation. And we think that there's also, once you look into it deeply, a few causes that stand out, and then a bunch that seem, you know, although they're, they might be very promising, just not quite as promising as those top ones. And we think that since a lot of those areas can absorb a lot of effort, effort in terms of you know, money or time, it's better to focus on those few than to go into everything that could possibly be very important because we don't have the capability to do that. And uh, expanding our organization would have some, some really important costs and we don't think the trade-off is worth it right now. Uh, 
I'm not sure if more questions have loaded in. It seems like we have a couple. Um, yeah, I guess we have a more general question, uh, which is what's something that you've learned uh, that surprised you and how did it change your approach? Me personally or OpenPhil? You personally, although you can speak on behalf of OpenPhil if you'd like. Yeah. Um, one thing that really surprised me was that when we talked to a number of the top scientists in the scientist survey that I mentioned, there was a lot of consensus about what the biggest issues in science were in terms of ways in which the system was suboptimal and could be improved. And we talked to scientists you know, from different institutions, different places, some of them are different ages, and there was not consensus on some issues, but there were a few that almost every single scientist brought up. And I found that fascinating because I didn't expect that there would, that scientists would have such similar mindsets about these things. And I also would have expected that if everyone agreed that something was a problem, something <laughs> more active would already be done about it. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case. And I think now that I understand it better, I see some of the reasons why. But um, yeah, I did find that quite surprising. Can you share the reasons why? Uh, I can in an upcoming blog post. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> to be continued, I guess. Continued. All right. <laughs> Yeah, um, and um, maybe you can like articulate the, the kinds of things that they had consensus on that you found surprising. Uh, yeah, sure. So one thing that they had a lot of consensus on was ways in which the way that science is funded is suboptimal and prevents the most ambitious and innovative science from moving forward very quickly. Uh, that was, I think, the greatest point of consensus and also the most surprising to me because uh, it seemed like a you know, I thought naively coming in that that was a very complicated issue and people would disagree about how to make innovative things happen. But there was at least some things that they all thought you should not do to make innovative things happen and those things were happening and is a big problem. <laughs> um, another area of consensus that uh, was fairly common that I think is not as controversial is uh, that um, it's the, it has taken longer and longer for young scientists to reach the point where they have more independence and can do more of their own research, which is difficult because uh, young people sometimes have out of the box ideas that they wanna pursue. And if they become very used to just doing incremental steps, helping someone else, it's hard for them by the time they finally get more independence to take advantage of that independence to the same degree. Plus it's made the process of being in science unpleasant in certain ways and potentially uh, attracted people who, uh, or it's driven away people that are more interested in the bold, innovative, kind of young, creative thinking because they're not able to do it to the same degree. Right. Can you um, maybe, although this might also be a to be continued sort of thing, um, is there something in that space in particular that OpenPhil has funded or is like looking into funding um, since there was so much consensus on something not actually happening? Uh, yeah, that's another thing that we're thinking hard about, but we, uh, I think, are still in some of the early stages, and so that's, I'll have to say that's another <laughs> TVC. Cool. All right. Um, yeah, well, I think I've gotten to most of the questions that people ask, so I'm going to call a wrap there, but if you'd like to ask questions afterward, I'm sure you're welcome to. Let's yeah. thank Claire again. Thank you.